and you and you duck and cover. We all know the atomic bomb is very dangerous. That's why these children are practicing to duck and cover. But no matter where they go or what they do, they always try to remember what to do if the atom bomb explodes right then. It's a bomb, duck and cover. You know how bad sunburn can feel. The atomic bomb flash could burn you worse than a terrible sunburn. Till then I know just what I'll do. Barbie, beautiful Barbie. I'll make believe that I am you. You can tell it's Mattel. It's swell. We knew the world would not be the same. Few people laughed. Few people cried. Most people were silent. I remembered the line from the Hindu scripture, the Bhagavad Gita. Vishnu is trying to persuade the prince that he should do his duty. And to impress him, takes on his multi-armed form and says, now I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. I suppose we all thought that. One way or another. I'm Knuff, user of Kenergy. Alright, this bit's getting old. I don't like wearing hats. You know, I never could wear hats for very long, because I got, like, this fat baby head, so I always get these, like, red rings around my forehead. I mean, you could almost say I'm a little boy with a fat man head. Welcome back to the Retro Robo Boy channel, where we have part two of our Barbenheimer experience. And I am still just dumbfounded by this whole phenomenon. And I think it's amazing that we finally have two movies that, you know, like, mean something to some capacity um big budgets and have amazing actors and great directors and it just kind of goes to show hey when you get an auteur director and give them the freedom to express themselves and be creative and don't try and force them to fit into any specific market you actually get good movies who would have fucking guessed but you know, I'm not going to go on that rant about Hollywood right now. I'm just happy that we have these two movies and that we all got to share this experience together. Just like anyone else, I'm a pretty big fan of Christopher Nolan. I, I wouldn't call myself a Nolan head, even though I think I do own all of his movies on my shelf. Uh, as far as my personal favorite, uh, excluding this one, well, whether or not it's my favorite, we'll find out by the end of this review. But I would probably have to say over time, Interstellar really just kind of grew on me when i first saw it i wasn't like absolutely in love with it but upon rewatches it just became more and more of my favorite i mean the dark knight trilogy is excellent prestige is underrated memento is underrated dunkirk was great tenet was kind of disappointing and i think it's just bloated and its dialogue was just way 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 too exposition heavy however i was super excited when this was announced because i am a big history guy especially anything entering in you know world war one world war two and this is so embarrassing to admit, but I, I literally have a playlist on my one of my personal channels, literally just titled Nukes, where I have a bunch of declassified nuclear footage. Like I just, it, just like tornadoes or hurricanes, it's one of those things where yes, it's so destructive and terrible, but there's something so mesmerizing and just oddly beautiful. Uh, in this divine sense about the explosive power of atomic energy. And I happen to know a lot about World War II and about the Manhattan Project, so I was excited to see how Nolan would tackle it. And I mean, this cast, holy shit. He just said, give me everybody you got. And he made all those phone calls and you know, Nolan, he's powerful. He can make people disappear. So if Nolan gives you a call, you show up for his movie. And Christopher Nolan really knows how to pick them. I mean, we got Josh from Drake and Josh. We got Roderick from Diary of a Wimpy Kid. We got Alex Wolf from Naked Brothers Band. I mean, we got this like Nickelodeon trinity here. I am a very famous person. Who am I? A hobo? 
No, I am a famous scientist. Harry Potter. Dude, I'm Albert Einstein. I mean, what more could you ask for? These three could carry the movie alone. I got it. I got a good one. I got a good one. Somebody farted. <laughs> <laughs> Roderick rules. Man. Yes, Roderick Roger rules. rules. Yeah. Yes. This is also going to be a first for this channel and something that probably won't happen often. But this is actually the first time I'm reviewing a movie that I was able to see in theaters twice before doing my reviews because there's a lot to go over here and I'm going to go in. I'm going to go in. I'm dropping the bomb. Legalized nuclear bomb. Swag Messiah. Now, unfortunately, neither time was I able to see it in a true 70 millimeter IMAX screening. Now, oh God, do I even want to get into all the technical IMAX shit? Jeez. You know what? Just real quick, we're going to go on a little rant about IMAX. So for those of you who don't know, Christopher Nolan is a big supporter of shooting things on film versus digital. And if you don't really know what the difference is, well, film is on celluloid film. It is a photochemical process. It's not done through computers. It's not ones and zeros like digital. And for reference, here's a piece of authentic film. This is a cut, um, a frame from Interstellar. Actually, I don't know if that's gonna be able to be picked up on camera. But anyways, nah, it's not no fucking way yeah but this is this is what it looks like so that means that that image is going to have infinite resolution it's going to have basically infinite clarity that's why you could see so many old movies get remastered and still look so good it just is able to capture this grit this texture and it, it quite literally is you know moving pictures and that's what's so beautiful about it so when dealing with IMAX, IMAX film is significantly larger than a normal piece of film. You're able to get much taller images and it gives you even greater picture. And there's not really many movies shot on true IMAX film cameras because they're super heavy, super loud, super expensive. And it just, it's, it's a much quick and easier thing to do digital. But again, it doesn't yield the same results. So of course, when this movie came out, it's all like, oh, you got to see it on IMAX, got to see it on IMAX. That's insane. If you were to unroll the entire movie it would be 11 miles long of film it weighs 900 pounds it takes two or three people to operate it and i'm like holy shit i would love to do that sadly though there's only like 30 theaters in the u.s i think maybe even the world that are able to properly show this film at least from what i understand and there is one theater in Dallas that is able to project 70 millimeter IMAX film and there's one in San Antonio there's the only two in Texas so I'm like, oh, great. Well, I'll just do that. Two weeks ahead of time, I'm like, all right, let's get some tickets for me and the boys. Holy shit, they're all sold out. And I'm like, uh, okay, uh, let me let me see. Um, maybe uh, next week? Nope, sold out. Next week? Nope, sold out. This shit was sold out for three weeks. Nolan's like, oh, you got to see it in IMAX. I'm like, bitch, I tried. Those gross, grubby, nasty little Nolan freaks bought all the tickets. <sighs> But fortunately, I was able to catch a digital screening of it in IMAX. So while not as clear and it's not all the fancy, you know, gadgets, all that, I still got to see an expanded ratio. Now, it fortunately was LIMAX, <laughs> which to be even more specific is basically instead of getting the full square 143-1 aspect ratio, it's actually cropped down to like a 191 ratio, um, which is still taller than your traditional, you know, center screen ratio. And you still notice a, a bit of a difference. But what pisses me off is that they charge the same price, even though it's digital and even though it's not the full frame but because they can call it IMAX and have like the nicer speakers they can still charge for the IMAX price and I'm like that's bullshit I still did it twice though anyways most of this movie is just a bunch of dudes talking in rooms so it's not really necessary it's still beautiful to get you know that that full full ratio and, and, and get that impact of that cinematography but honestly I hate to admit it, but you're probably not missing out all that much by seeing this in just a traditional theater. Regardless of how you choose to see the movie, seeing it in theaters and just supporting movies is is, is a great thing to do. And even though this is an R-rated film it's, and, it's a, and it's a slow, you know, dry historical biopic, it's getting amazing box office results. And I think that's just such a good sign. It shows that people are not stupid. They want to watch good movies and you just got to give it to them, take risks. So I'm very happy I made the decision to see both Barbie and Oppenheimer and 
It's great, so let's get into that story. Oppenheimer follows the American theoretical physicist throughout his life and his discipline. We see his revolutionary contributions during his youth while studying physics, leading him to become a professor at Berkeley University, where he's admired by his students and colleagues alike. But a harrowing opportunity is presented when he is offered the chance to participate in the war effort on behalf of the American government, when Officer Leslie Groves recruits him to the Manhattan Project, the top secret government operation to build the first atom bomb in a race against Nazi Germany, in hopes of finally ending the war. The existential weight and moral consequences that follow such an achievement haunt Oppenheimer to his grave, and because of this post-Hiroshima-Nagasaki anti-nuclear sentiments, he must prove himself an ally to his country in a time rifled with Red Scare communist panic. So right off the bat, I'm gonna say I'm very happy that this movie for the most part, is very historically accurate. There's obviously a little bit dramatized here and there, but not nearly as much as your typical Hollywood fare. And I'm also happy to say that it doesn't try and romanticize or glorify anyone or, or make anyone out to be a good guy or a bad guy. It is very gray across the board for the most part. Um, I'll get more into the politics side of it towards the end of the review for anyone who's interested, but for the most part, it, it's pretty cut and dry, and I, I give them a lot of props for not holding people's hand, per se. This movie jumps across many different points in time, and it's structured in a very dynamic way. It's the first thing I noticed. It almost felt like it was in perpetual montage, like almost like a trailer, um, which was hard to adjust to at first, but once you get with the flow of the movie, they're able to tie themes and ideas together better by connecting different points in time, re, you know, recalling ideas, flashing forward, um, and it, it led with a little bit of mystery. Um, even even though it's a historical piece, they still found a way through a certain character to kind of lead this little little seed, plant this little seed that sprouted later. And it was it was fascinating how they were able to just through the structure and editing create something that felt so intense and had so much momentum regardless of its runtime. Also through the use of color and through the use of hair and makeup. Um, you were able to differentiate the different points in time. At first it was confusing, across my uh, second watch it was much easier, but it was impressive how much they were able to do just with hair and makeup uh, to differentiate the, the points in time. So that's, that's really where Christopher Nolan's style came in and the structure, and I think it's, it's the structure of the movie is both its strongest point, but at times also its weakest points. Its nonlinear structure did help, you know, drive the movie and make it more interesting and engaging. But at the same time, I can't help but wonder what this movie would have uh, looked like if it was just a little bit more linear. It might have helped it from being so jarring and confusing at first. Uh, in this movie definitely will benefit from rewatches, but I think that sometimes it's needlessly complicated and sometimes the pacing can be hurt just a little bit by putting certain events after others and it, it kind of creates the sense of like, oh, this thing's a little petty, this thing was more interesting if you just, you know, it, it's kind of difficult, again, because it's based on history. Um, it's kind of hard to present the information and make it feel 100% balanced. The movie that everyone's going to compare this to is JFK, but another movie that it kind of reminded me of just a teeny tiny bit was something like Social Network is another movie that is mostly courtroom drama, mostly dialogue, but through its music and through its editing and style, it was able to create this, this very exciting movie. And I don't really believe in spoilers in a historical drama. Uh, sorry, I'm not trying to be pretentious, but it's like, bro, it's shit that happened. Like. Anyways, you know, anything that I think is going to be super spoilery, I will say for a spoiler section, but for the most part, I am going to go through the plot of the entire movie, but I don't think that's going to hinder anyone, anyone's enjoyment, but uh, I'll, I'll try and keep it down to a minimum. Something that I don't really think is a spoiler is that the, the actual bomb sequence happens about two thirds of the way into the film, and that's really where my, my, my discussion about the structure is applicable because you know, so much of that middle chunk of the movie is being driven, just absolutely propelled by that race to build this bomb. So once it's done and it happens, there's this kind of lull afterwards. And even though the, the stuff that happened afterwards was fascinating, it just pales in comparison to what came before it. And it, it, that's kind of what I think hurts the structure just a little bit. There's like two different times where the movie really shifts gears and it, it can be kind of jarring and it, it almost, they feel kind of detached. And it's all about Oppenheimer, of course, 
But again, it, it, it's tricky. And again, I, I can't help but wonder what would this movie have looked like if it was just rearranged in a slightly different order. And I gotta say right here and now, Killian Murphy absolutely owns this entire movie. His performance is gripping, probably the best of his entire career. And I know everyone goofs on him about it, uh, but you know, his just baby blue crystal white walker eyes, I guess you could call them, you know, zombie eyes, but people like to make fun of them. But the intensity in his eyes and the emotion he's able to bring with just simple facial expressions and, and, and just the way he, he really just goes through his monologues and, and he really just gets lost in this character and it's amazing to see him work. I mean, obvious Oscar nomination, Robert Downey Jr., same thing. He's gonna get an Oscar nomination. I mean, there's not a single bad actor in this entire movie. Yes, that even includes our Nickelodeon stars who only get one line of dialogue, but I just had to get that out of the way now before I forget, uh, who could forget, Killian Murphy is just the best. I gotta give so much props and so much credit for the fact that 90 per, like 90 percent of this movie is closed door politics and heated discussions inside of rooms and stuff but it's still managed to be very engaging pretty much its whole three hour runtime and that's really hard to do the movie opens with a young 20 something oppenheimer in the 1920s in college having visions of atomic energy and these just abstract displays of what atoms might look like and it, it, it was it was almost like jump scares like the way the base was popping in and you have him you know seeing little visions of the future and it just was just it was something so magical and it was just such a great way to start the movie it got me so excited and then we also see how troubled he was uh in his youth and he actually tried to poison his teacher with cyanide which is a real thing by the way and i was wondering if they were going to put that in the movie and when it was like within the first like five ten minutes i was like oh there it is and i was like hell yeah and i felt rewarded i was like "Ooh, they got all they're getting the details right so far and then he gets introduced to niels bohr and this movie is just name drop after name drop a scientist it is the the nerdy scientist avengers basically he then moves to germany where he can study more theoretical physics and that's where he meets the famous german physicist werner heisenberg who eventually would go on to work on the nuclear bomb under hitler and it's during this moment where he's in germany where we get to see this beautiful montage where he's looking at art and you get to hear ludwig's amazing score and again the, the montages and the music in this movie are some of the best i've ever seen in recent years and what's nice is that even though most people obviously aren't going to be very well versed in physics myself included um they do a really good job of still um you know not dumbing it down not treating you stupid but they they, they find a way to compartmentalize it and just give you the the key highlights to help you understand just just how exciting and how revolutionary uh, of a time this was. Across the whole scientific community, there were so many leaps and bounds, for example, like the splitting of the atom, as well as the rise of American communist ideals and the rise of the student unions. We then see Oppenheimer come back to the United States to bring theoretical physics to the US as he becomes a professor at Berkeley. It's at his time teaching in Berkeley that we get introduced to a lot of the key characters and when he meets his two love interests, that's right, two love interests. His mistress and lover, whom he has an intermittent affair with named Jean Tatlock, a communist party member played by Florence Pugh, and his soon-to-be wife, Catherine Puning, played by Emily Blunt. Both actresses brought a lot to their performance, even with limited screen time. And there's been some complaints about female representation in this film. And while there was hundreds of people who worked on the Manhattan Project, including women, the core team of people were men, so, and it's considering this movie is a historical piece, I definitely do agree with representation, but I feel like complaining about female representation in this movie is equally as silly as people who complained about the male representation in Barbie. It's like, uh, you gotta look at what the movie's about and who it's aimed for and what it's trying to say and, and take all of that into account. And there really just wasn't uh, a place for interjecting that kind of uh, representation in that specific way, if that makes sense. It's also during this time that you start to see Robert Oppenheimer's association with the Communist Party and his interest in socialist ideas through his love interests as well as through his brother. And this would plant the seed for the US government's mistrust in him and, and questioning his allegiance 
to capitalist America and 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 is what kind of put him in, in shady waters when deciding to bring him onto the project. Even though Russia was our ally during World War II against fascism and against Nazis, at the end of the day, it was more of a you know, the enemy of the enemy is my friend kind of deal. And there there definitely was still tensions between the two of us. It was really nice to see Josh Arnett playing Ernest Lawrence, the physicist who invented the cyclotron. I think he's an underrated actor. And it's, it's been a while since I've seen him in anything. So when I saw his face, I was like, oh shit, I didn't know he was in this. And it was really nice to see him and Oppenheimer's relationship. And you, you kind of see him push back on you know a lot of Oppenheimer's socialist leanings uh, because he didn't want him to get into messy entanglements with the FBI. That's when General Leslie Groves, played by Matt Damon, is introduced to recruit him to join the war effort. He's easily my favorite supporting actor in this entire movie. Don't get me wrong, Robert Downey Jr. is amazing, and I'll talk about him in a bit. But for some reason, the like kind of like <laughs> I guess bromance between uh, General Groves and and Robert Oppenheimer was just so fun to see and like you could tell you know th they had slightly different views and they they had their, their differences but whenever they would work together it was great and they they had this kind of like mutual respect for each other in spite of their circumstances and i don't know just some, something about the dry humor that he brought to it i thought was just great that's the great thing about this movie is that it has a lot of very complex relationships it's also important to point out that even though oppenheimer was secular he still was jewish Obviously, this gave him a lot of incentive and motivation to race against the Nazis and get the upper hand and keep the world from being overthrown by fascism. We then see another excellent montage where they assemble their fellow scientists and begin to build the town in Los Alamos in New Mexico. They wanted to be able to bring their families so they could work around the clock and be all together and share their ideas. The best F-bomb in the whole movie is when Matt Damon is yelling at the scientist and it's just... It's, it's like so epic and, and so funny, but also very powerful. And it just was like, I don't know, it was an awesome, awesome little scene. It's also at this point we're introduced to Edward Teller, played by Benny Safdie, of the famous Safdie brother directors who directed Uncut Gems, as well as one of my favorites, Good Time. Edward Teller was the creator of the hydrogen bomb. And it was at this point when helping to develop the atomic bomb that he pointed out that it might actually start a chain reaction that could destroy the entire world. Which is just fascinating to think about that, you know, I mean, fortunately we're all here, so it didn't happen, but they had, you know, a small chance of igniting the atmosphere and it just not stopping and the entire world setting off a flame. And it's like, uh, I don't know if that was worth the risk, but I guess it was, I don't know. I wouldn't have done that shit. Oppenheimer brings this news to Albert Einstein and asks him, what do you think of it? He's looking for some affirmation uh, and, and for Einstein to kind of sort it out. And Einstein jokingly says, well, we're, you know, we're both shit at math. He's like, you're, you're stuck in your world of probabilities. You're just gonna have to find out. Imagine how that feels going to Albert Einstein, looking for some clarity, some, some confirmation, some closure. And he basically tells you, shit, dude, I don't know. <laughs> There was a lot of debate among scientists whether or not any of this information should be shared with our allies in Russia, but the United States was very strict on any information leaking out because they did not want Russia to get the upper hand over us, which gave them even more incentive to be suspicious of anyone that had any left wing or any socialist ideologies. And Oppenheimer's lover, unfortunately, got caught up in the mix whenever he went to see her. And it's still debated to this day whether or not that she actually committed suicide or if she was assassinated. And I like that they kind of leave that ambiguous in the movie. I also really appreciate that this movie didn't try and romanticize or glorify Oppenheimer or, or go out of their way to make him look like a good guy or a bad guy. They, they very much kind of just laid out the facts and let you see him you know, in his most vulnerable state. You know, they don't try and hide the fact that he tried to kill his teacher and that he was a serial cheater. And like a lot of scientists, he had a bit of an ego, but he definitely was far from what someone you could call immoral. He was a very complicated and complex man, and he definitely felt very responsible for a lot of things. And, and the movie does such a good job of, of going through that character study. I'm so sick of so many movies that try and just spoon feed you everything. And it's like, you should trust your audience to be able to figure it out for themselves. 
After nearly three years and two billion dollars of work on the bomb, it's announced that Adolf Hitler has committed suicide. So at this point, the entire Manhattan Project team starts debating whether or not this bomb should even be used anymore now that they no longer have to drop it on Berlin. We see a group of young students protesting amongst themselves and Oppenheimer comes up and lets them know that at the end of the day, it's not their decision, it's the military and the government's decision. And it's at this point in the movie where the moral quandary really starts to bake and they really get into it and it, they do not, not hold back. Uh, and they definitely don't try and make the US government look good, which I greatly appreciate because to this day, it's highly debated whether or not dropping the bombs were necessary. And the argument that people usually bring up is that, you know, statistically speaking, it saved more lives than it hurt because more American soldiers and Japanese soldiers would have been hurt if there was a, a land invasion, right? Um, and also too, the fire bombings in Tokyo killed more people than Nagasaki or Hiroshima. So, it, it, you know, when you really add up the numbers, it isn't, isn't so bad. But that's the thing, it's like, you're talking about people, not numbers, number one. But number two, Russia actually was already planning their terms and conditions of surrender and planning on invading. But the United States ultimately wanted to have a show of power. They built this bomb. They were always intending to use it somewhere and they wanted to show the world that we mean business. The first bomb was to psychologically scar and terrorize the people. The second bomb was to show that we can do it again and again. While technically speaking, Japan had not surrendered after the first bomb. And yes, we did drop down warnings ahead of time, warning the people uh, that, uh, that a bomb was coming. Many of those people, or if not pretty much all of them, ultimately were gonna stay regardless because the government tells them, hey, this is US propaganda, just ignore it. But at the end of the day, they knew for a fact that this was going to be absolutely detrimental. There were no, you know, military targets that they could pick. So it was always going to come down to killing civilians who had nothing to do with any of this. So just knowing that the biggest motivational factor for the U.S. to use bombs was strictly to flex its military might as a new dominant world power just ultimately is really sickening and just just absolutely monstrous. I would say probably one of my favorite scenes, if not my favorite scene in the whole movie, is when you actually get to sit in on that war room meeting and they're when they're actually deciding to pick what targets. There's this just really just like gross moment where, where, where one of the generals is going over the list of cities. He crosses off Kyoto and he says, Kyoto, you know, has historical significance and cultural significance to the people. And he's like, and me and my wife actually visited there on my home honeymoon. It was absolutely beautiful. And he like lets out a little chuckle and you just see the whole room is just dead silent. And it's like, dude, you're a fucking monster. <laughs> like it, the fact that just a stroke of a pen, you know, saved all those lives from dying and meant this other group of people was going to die. It just, it really puts in perspective. Wow. That was a close one. Like if you picture yourself, if your city was just narrowly missed, uh, on, on a list of cities to be destroyed. Um, and again, it's a really great way to illustrate the banality of evil. You know, evil isn't vicious mustache twirling villains. It isn't evil psychos with knives. It's men in suits and ties sitting in a room having discussions. I mean, that's where most of the world's most profound and powerful evil is happening. And it's just crazy, you know, uh, Oppenheimer lets him know, hey, you know, a lot of the scientists are thinking about not using it. And everyone in the room is like, hey, yeah, shut the fuck up. And it's, it's very, it's scary. It's like this giant game of chess, but the pieces are people. And, and at the end of the day in war, there's not really winners and losers, there's just survivors. And it's also nice that I, I noticed on the second time around that this is actually one of the few scenes in the movie that doesn't have music blaring. And I think that silence creates this, this greater sense of discomfort and really just kind of lets you brew and just how dire of a situation it is. So around the two thirds point of the movie is when the big moment happens and the test is finally ready to be done. The way the music is rapidly ramping up over the course of the montage is just relentless and it keeps going and going like a train and you're on the edge of your seat the whole time. And I'm so happy they gave our boy Josh the honor of pressing that big red button. He deserves it. But this is where I'm gonna have to get a little controversial and please stick with me here. 
I think that the explosion itself was kind of underwhelming. I mean, it's all right. Like, overrated as fuck, in my opinion. I mean, I know, I know, but hear me out. I understand Nolan's love with practical filmmaking and practical effects, and I'm inclined to agree with him for the most part that practical effects and things shot on camera usually look better than anything that's computer generated. It's an absolute achievement that none of this movie was made using computer generated 3D imagery, you know, CGI, and that they were able to capture so much beauty through the cinematography, the lighting, as well as that beautiful score. But in this one instance, I think that it might have helped to use just a little bit of CG enhancements. Even after watching it twice, I'm still not 100% in love with how they handled the explosion effect. I would even go as far as to say that the buildup and the aftermath were the best part of that scene. That that buildup was, I mean, you could, it was, it was pen drop in that room. It was so tense. And the aftermath was, was just so, there, there was this catharsis. There was this big emotional uh, um, release and a physical release for some of us. And I think there's something oddly powerful and beautiful about that fact that it really wasn't the just the explosion. It was the friends we made along the way. <laughs> Fuck, I couldn't help myself. No, okay. But what I meant to say was it wasn't just, it wasn't all just about the explosion. It really was about the people and about the drama. And I can say almost 100% for certain how they did this shot. They haven't released any behind the scenes yet, but I've seen enough Godzilla movies and kaiju films to know how filming miniatures works. It's obvious that they detonated several medium sized explosions and then they adjusted the exposure and shutter speed and probably shot at a really high frame rate to capture these explosions with high contrast and, 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 and create the, this, you know, very mesmerizing slow motion speed. And it was, you know, these hypnotizing, beautiful clouds, you know, it gives the illusion uh, of size when you know when when you fill them up close but the medium shots didn't really register well like they didn't really give the impression like you, you have a, a kind of a hard time of of you know recognizing what the scale of everything is and i get that some of that probably was on purpose i mean nolan is a very specific guy i think i i don't think they just settled with what they had i do think this was done on purpose i think the point was that it was supposed to be disorienting i mean at the end of the day it is through oppenheimer and the scientist's perspective and this this explosion was from eight miles away so this shit was far away and it, it when it first uh ignited it was so bright i think it's something like five times brighter than the surface of the sun so the whole desert would have literally been daytime for a few seconds in the middle of the night um but even then i still you don't really get that impression of its size very well and it, it's it's comped into the scene well i mean it doesn't it doesn't look bad it just doesn't really get that oomph that you were expecting and and a lot of that has to do with the fact that they, they've hyped it so much in the advertising which i think was a bad idea and i know this would have been cheating but i actually think it would have been really smart if they actually showed like a cameraman there filming and then they actually incorporated the real test bomb footage because that shit looks great. I mean, that that's really impressive. And I think, you know, that would have been a good way to have historical fact while still having a beautiful looking explosion. So there's a lot about the scene that I do adore. And I still think that it was cinematically brilliant in a lot of ways, but the actual explosion itself, I mean, it ain't got nothing on Terminator 2. <laughs> and I even would say that the explosion effect and Twin Peaks was pretty damn good. You know, just some things I would have done differently myself, but I'm also not Christopher fucking Nolan, so take that with a grain of salt. My favorite part about the scene was actually the use of sound, or I should say the use of no sound, because again, it the explosion was eight miles away. Light travels significantly faster than sound, so you see that bright flash, you hear everyone breathing and gasping and just just taking it in that what just happened. And it, you know, it's it's about I don't know how many seconds or, or or you know, minutes until you hear that initial kaboom, but it was like a jump scare. I mean, everyone in the theater was just like oh, shit.
it was crazy. It was awesome. And it just, it just shook the whole theater. And it's nice to see explosions depicted realistically because in all these movies, there's always, but it's like, that's not really how it works. Even some smaller explosions, still, it takes a while for that shock wave to hit you if it's far away. And it's, 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 it's just insane. Definitely one of the best cinematic jump scares of all time. You then have this very brief victorious celebration, all the scientists cheering, and you know, it's, it's, you know, almost like it seems like this heroic moment until it sets in, oh shit. It's time, they're gonna use them now. The decision of how, when, and where they were used was not left to the scientists, and if it was up to them, it would never be used, and they wanted to find a way to display the power and, and show off the power without anyone having to get hurt. The military wanted to do it in the most unambiguous way possible. Oppenheimer even lends uh, an additional helping hand to Groves before he leaves, and Groves basically was like, uh, yeah, don't call us, we'll call you. And then they left his ass on red. Oppenheimer and crew had to find out, just like every other American, through Truman announcing it on the radio. Um, and they were all having sleepless nights, and then they finally hear, oh shit, it worked. It happened. You get the sense that so many of these scientists got so lost in their work, were so driven by the prospect of scientific advancement, that they were able to disassociate and kind of remove themselves from the reality of the situation. But at this point, they could no longer absolve themselves of their guilt. Initially, they all joined because it was a race against the Nazis to keep evil fascist government from getting it and taking over the whole world. But now the United States was using this godlike weapon of mass genocide onto civilian targets and there's nothing more that they were able to do about it. Scientists historically are, you know, used when they're useful and then kicked to the curb once the job's done. Following Japan's surrender, we see Oppenheimer is invited to give a speech about America's victory. He's reading this triumphant American patriotic propaganda speech while people wail and cheer and are stomping their feet on school bleachers. But he starts to break down and have in this internal panic attack as he starts to hallucinate and envision the bomb being dropped and he sees all the people engulfed in the atomic light. My heart literally dropped to my stomach. It was so horrific because you hear these loud cheers and suddenly it's broken by the sound of a screaming child and it just goes silent. And, you, and it just painted this picture in my mind and I went, oh my God, that's probably the sound of a young Japanese child. You then see one of the women in the audience, her face starts to peel off slowly, layers of skin start to peel off as it burns from her face. You see, you know, everyone in, in the bleachers start to get just atomized and it was a great artistic um, way to show the effects of the bomb, but without getting too gross or exploitative. It also shows just a nightmare brewing in Oppenheimer's mind as he realizes, you know, the bomb will fall on the just and the unjust alike. And as he leaves the auditorium, you know, you, all the all the sound from the real world starts to come back in and you see everyone's, you know, screaming and cheering. And as he, he goes out into the lobby, he sees some of his fellow, fellow scientists just sobbing. And then he goes outside and our boy Roderick, oh man, they did Roderick so dirty. He's just slumped over this bicycle rack, just vomiting out his nose and his mouth, just sobbing. Like they, just the guilt is finally starting to sink in and they realize these people have no fucking idea what they've unleashed on the world and, and the world that they're living in and what, what the Japanese had to go through. There's another really horrific scene shortly after where you actually see all the scientists sitting in on a slideshow presentation where they're being shown photos of the aftermath of the bombings and they're, they're getting to see for the first time ever not only the city but the victims and the effects of the radiation of the heat blast and they don't show anything but you just see their faces and, and you just see Oppenheimer just look away and you just keep hearing the gasp as they keep you know switching the slides which I again think was a very respectful way to shed light on the victims, but without making it too gross and exploitative and weird and like, you know, making like, you know, because not to go on a rant, okay, I'm going to go on another rant, I apologize. I keep seeing so many people complain that they didn't show the bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And I, 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 I see other people complain, you know, that there isn't enough Japanese representation in the movie. And I have two very strong arguments against both both of those things. Because the people complaining about not seeing the bombings, those are more like douchebags 
Going like, man, this this Christopher Nolan movies are supposed to be epic, bro. This was an epic. I thought I was going to get to see the explosion. I thought I was going to see the Japanese get bombed, man. I'm like, that's a dumb fucking take. Uh, number one, this isn't a movie about World War II. It's a movie about J. Robert Oppenheimer, the physicist. It's about how, how he got the job, how they did it, and the fallout and aftermath. Uh, and, and how that has changed the world. Okay. If you want a World War II movie, watch Dunkirk. Watch Saving Private Ryan. Watch some other fucking movie with a shitload of explosions. Watch the shitty-ass Pearl Harbor movie. This movie is through Robert Oppenheimer's perspective. He was not there when it happened. He had to find out just like everyone else. It makes you feel like you're in his shoes. You realize just how far removed he actually was from the event itself. Number two. People who are saying, oh, we need Japanese representation... For what? To get fucking decimated? To get absolutely obliterated? Do we really need to see that? I mean, you know, 4K epic IMAX experience. Get your soda and popcorn and watch these babies and kids get melted alive. It's like, that's weird, man. That's just like not cool. And I'm not saying I'm against violence in movies, uh, you know, historical representations of violence. I just don't think that Christopher Nolan is really the guy to do that. I don't think it's really the time and place. I think it's more important for Japanese voices and for the Japanese perspective to share that story. That's, that's for them to do. And they have done it. If you want to see a movie that focuses on the victims and really delves into the effects of the psychological trauma and, and, and really just how horrible that was. The greatest uh, example that everyone's gonna say is Barefoot Gen. It's a manga uh, that was actually written by one of the survivors of Hiroshima. And there's an anime adaptation that's great that was released in 1980, I think, somewhere around there. And then there's, a, there's multiple live action films from the 70s as well as a live action TV drama from the 2000s that's also really good. Um, and then people always say Grave of the Fireflies, but that's technically about the Tokyo firebombing, actually. Um, but that's still a great film. So I think, again, you know, they they found a way to, to show the effects and go into how horrible it was without using imagery of, of Japanese people suffering grotesque, horrible deaths for the entertainment and, and joy of American audiences. So again, I, I, I can kind of see both sides of it, but I, I, I think that this movie was very classy and just very um, respectful because they, they, still, they still, again, show how terrible it was, how horrible it was, definitely make America look like the bad guys. They do not make America look good at all. Um, but without, again, showing like dead babies and shit uh so yeah as far as japanese representation goes i think that in this particular instance um leave it to uh japanese directors and again they've they've done it multiple times a lot of great films a lot of good documentaries too so if you want to you know see that perspective and really get the full history um they, there's a lot of wonderful uh films and, and media that have been made about that subject, and I highly recommend it. And contrary to everything I just said, I actually wouldn't have minded if they delved just a little bit more into the effects. You kind of overhear him, uh, the, the, the person giving the presentation, talk about how their clothes are burnt to their skin and stuff, but I think as far as how radiation affects people and like over time, I know these are definitely things that Oppenheimer would have saw and heard about, so I think it would have been nice for them to just spend a little bit more time on that but they definitely didn't ignore it. And even on the slideshow, if they really wanted to, I wouldn't have been mad, or I don't think it would have been 100% distasteful if they did show like recreated images or, or you know, some like practical effects of burnings or more specifically, I think would have been a great showcase of the power, a very powerful image that a lot of people know is the shadow people, the, the, the burnt shadows that, you know, it was so bright, so hot. There were people who were literally atomized completely just obliterated so fast that it actually left an imprint of their shadow on the walls and on the ground. Um, literally the light flashed around them. So all around the trace of these people were burnt onto walls, but their physical being no longer remained. It was just, just dust in the wind. Um, you know, that's, that's something I think that you could, you could show that wouldn't be just absolutely horrendous uh, to look at, but still be very um, powerful. And they, they found a way to show the effects of the bomb 
in an artistic way that again i just think was more respectful than showing people looking up in the sky going ah you know what i mean like i just that that's not that's not meant for you know the imax experience i think that would just be a little distasteful the one complaint that people are bringing up that i actually think is a hundred percent valid and would have been something good to bring up is actually the american casualties uh, a lot of people don't realize that there were uh, both mexican and native american people in the uh, uh, new mexico desert who were affected by fallout of the bomb test and were you know they were completely displaced from their homes and 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 that was just an absolutely horrendous tragedy and they do mention that um you know the land was not given back to the native americans and oppenheimer was you know very naive to think that they would let that they would actually give it back um so they do they do touch on that aspect that's something again i think they could have shed more light on so that 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 criticism i will agree with speaking of american assholes this is when we meet president truman played by gary oldman and gary oldman he's always the best he's always the best at makeup and hair and stuff so it was awesome to see him just kind of show up like this i forgot he was even in it but in this scene you know truman's basically saying like good job sport you know you're the father of the atomic bomb and you're on time magazine and oppenheimer basically is like you know i feel like i have blood on my hands and then that just triggers the living shit out of truman and he basically leads and says you know like boy <laughs> he doesn't say boy but he's he might as well have he says you know do you think the japanese give a shit about who built it they care about who dropped it and i'm the motherfucker who dropped it not you and he basically you know indirectly calls him a pussy and hands him a handkerchief and then says you know get this cry baby out of here and it's like holy shit talk about the banality of evil um <laughs> you know what an asshole uh and and it, what's crazy is that conversation was 100 percent true he did he did say that uh oppenheimer was a cry baby and it's like wow that's shitty while oppenheimer never apologized for the bombings directly he spent his entire life post-war trying to stop the development of nuclear weapons and keep the cold war from going to an even greater arms race the movie never tries to stay its message uh, too bluntly, but it's very obvious that nuclear weapons were our greatest mistake and something that's going to haunt humanity forever. And I think it's great that the movie is able to be very grim and dour, uh, but without being too definitive about anything or, again, being too exploitative. And it's a shame I haven't talked about him more at this point, but Robert Downey Jr. plays Louis Strauss, who was a chairman of the Atomic Energy Committee. And his character, you know, he, he's slightly more, uh, he's a, a more right-wing and religious uh, man. And him and Oppenheimer uh, had a lot of, you know, bickering back and forth about, uh, you know, the development of the hydrogen bomb and about, you know, our race against the Russians. And he was constantly confused and aggravated by Oppenheimer's, you know, reluctance uh, to support such nuclear developments. And then, of course, there was a, there was a more kind of petty squabble between them because of Oppenheimer humiliating him in court about the export of isotopes. This is easily one of Robert Downey Jr.'s best performances by far. And he's almost unrecognizable in that bald cap. I mean, they did an amazing job. The, the aging aging effects in this movie just across the board were really good. And at first, the use of black and white in this movie kind of confused me. But up, upon my second viewing, uh, it was it was a lot a lot easier to interpret that the the black and white scenes, uh, according to Christopher Nolan, are supposed to be the more objective moments. Uh, however. In, as far as the movie's concerned, I felt like it did a better job of, of kind of isolating Strauss's point of view as opposed to Oppenheimer's, and it, it kind of helped keep keep their their storyline separate. And it, when you're doing dealing with time jumping, it really helped to kind of have that contrast of the black and white versus the color. Even though Oppenheimer committed himself to his country and helped us pull off a miracle in the race against the evil fascist government, ultimately he was abandoned and kicked to the curb by his own government due to his prior political leanings and his advocacy against the development of more weapons. He was caught up in the McCarthy era of Red Scare and ultimately had to fight a losing battle to try and regain his security clearance access. But it's almost as if it was all by design because ultimately he was chosen not in spite of his background but because of it they were always able to uh, have leverage over him and dangle it over his head and it kind of shows that no matter how genius someone might be scientifically there's still a lot of naivete that can come from the lack of experience and wisdom while he was not without morality he was driven a lot by his ego and he thought his reputation could protect him but it didn't forever 
before I get into spoilers, uh, I'll go ahead and get just a little bit more into my kind of uh, political interpretations and, and, and more about what this movie's saying and give my final score. I think it is absolutely fascinating how many people are crying about how woke Barbie is when this movie is super woke when you actually look at it. And I mean, it's a big budget Hollywood production that pri whose characters are predominantly uh, socialist and communists who are represented more or less as very bright, intelligent, and heroic American figures. While the villains of the movie uh, are, you know, the, the, the US government, the bureaucrats, the uh, military industrial complex, it's very like anti-US military almost. And it, but not really, because the movie actually never really tries to say anything. It kind of just lays out the history and lays out the facts. So maybe that's why people aren't like calling this woke. I think it's funny they give Barbie so much shit, but then they give Oppenheimer a pass. And it's ultimately because there's no black people there's no gay people and there's no trans discussion and it's like the word woke has been completely appropriated and lost all meaning it's almost like they never knew what the word meant and they just slap it on anything they don't like in my barbie review i mentioned media literacy and that's something that applies here as well um and again this movie does kind of just lay out the facts in front of you they don't try and spell anything out so i guess you could say it's open to their interpretation but I don't think it's open to interpretation when it is based pretty much on majority facts. And the fact of the matter is that a lot of the brightest scientific minds tend to be left-leaning and tend to have more socialist ideas. And I think a lot of people are thinking that just because Oppenheimer and his wife are denouncing communism, that they found the light and, and, and subscribe to patriotic American capitalist ideas. But you have to remember that they were fighting for their life there so they they had to say it to, to save their own skins and when you actually look at the history and look at the policies and things that they that they that they uh advocated for they very much weren't capitalist but i think that's kind of gonna go over most people's heads and you know there are so many great figures in history that we admire that were socialists, but no one ever brings it up. You know, Albert Einstein, J. Robert Oppenheimer, obviously, Martin Luther King Jr., Stephen Hawking, Nelson Mandela, Helen Keller, a lot of our great artists and writers like Mark Twain, Picasso, George Orwell, which people always love to quote 1984, and it's like, bro, the dude was socialist. <laughs> Again, these are all very well-respected, very smart individuals, and it's so often in media we demonize and ostracize, you know, communist figures because we associate communism with Soviet Russia, and it's like that's not all that communism and socialism is. And it's nice to see again this big-budget, dry, three-hour-long, you know, Christopher Nolan budgeted shot movie about you know, socialist historical figures. And, you know, it's, it's more, it's, of course, it's more than just about that, but you, I don't know how people can just ignore the fact that, that so much of this movie is about the red scare and about that McCarthy era. And I don't know, I, again, I just, it's, it's just a pet peeve. I'm like, damn, y'all really shit on Barbie and then gave Oppenheimer a pass, huh? I'm like, are y'all that stupid? Oh, well, what can you do? Now that I got that other rant over, now for my final thoughts. First time I saw the movie, I enjoyed it quite a bit, but admittedly, I was quite exhausted. I had just watched Barbie and I had a 20 minute intermission where I walked around outside in 100 degree Texas heat. Of course, on opening night, the theater was jam packed, so it was burning hot with body heat in there. So obviously I wasn't in the right state of mind to truly absorb in all the information. And it was just very jarring at first with, with that crazy fast paced structure. The dialogue is quite relentless as well as the editing style, so I think I just found myself very overwhelmed at first, and especially with all that music blaring non-stop. So I had to sit there, hold in my pee, and just hope that the movie was not boring. And fortunately, it wasn't. But damn, I had to pee, and I was sweating like crazy. I still think that the third act was a little messy, and there might have been a better way to keep the momentum post-nuclear detonation. 
I can't deny that this movie was just brimming with brilliance. It's a flawed masterpiece. There are some things I would have preferred over others. So I'm just barely, just barely scraping away from a 10 out of 10. I'm going to have to give the movie a 9.5 out of 10. I'm going to get into some of the little nitpicks in my spoiler section, but I'm very happy to say that my second viewing, I enjoyed it even more than the first. So who knows, maybe over time I will be giving this a 10 out of 10, but for now it's going to be a 9.5 out of 10. Let's get down into the nitty gritty. Um. Oh my god, we need to get into how cringy that sex scene was. Oh, now let me be clear. <laughs> I have no problem with sex scene in movies. Um, I have no problem with sex. Uh, I happen to quite enjoy it. If you've never tried it, I highly recommend it. It's awesome. <laughs> and I remember hearing the complaints of people saying like, oh, the sex scene in this movie was like crazy, like a 15 minute, 30 minute long sex scene with Florence Pugh and da da And I was like, what? And when you see the movie, it's actually very tame. Uh, and you know, people are like, oh, you know, you see her nipples. I'm like, yeah, well you get to, <laughs> you get to see uh, Killian Murphy's nipples. So fair game, who cares? Like it's just a nipple, who gives a shit? So it's not the fact that there was a sex scene it's not that it was too long or graphic or loud or whatever. What really just was just so cringy and so unnecessary was the use of the Bhagavita line, the Hindu scripture. Now I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. It's like, you took, oh man, you took the most like iconic, epic Oppenheimer quote most like one of the most profound statements ever about the godlike terror of this nuclear test right and you decide hmm let's put it in this sloppenheimer toppenheimer scene and it's like why did you do that it was so juvenile i, I felt like christopher nolan was like eh? Uh, you see what I did there? I'm like, yeah, why'd you do it? It was fucking stupid. Not only that, but you pissed off all the Hindu people on top of that by putting this, you know, religious text in the middle of this Sloppentimer, Toppenheimer scene. And, you know, again, I get it. I get it. She was trying to appeal to his intellect because he was distracted. And, you know, it's like, oh, it's like, oh, you know, he's, he's easily to manipulate, you know, because of his ego or whatever. I get it. But you didn't have to use that line. You, she could have pulled out a fucking physics book or literally anything else. And now, fortunately, they do use the line again uh, when he says it to himself after the bomb explosion. And that was fine. If they if they just left it at that, I would have been fine. I didn't need the whole interview or whatever. But I really didn't need to see Florence pubes give him Toppenheimer while he said, I am death, the story of worlds. Now, I mean, fortunately, if he was hitting it from the back and was like, I am death, the story of worlds. <laughs> That now that would have dropped the movie down like a, a whole another two points. So thankfully that didn't happen. But yeah, it just was really cringe and really juvenile and just really unnecessary. Another cringe line is whenever they do that like an Avengers name drop at the end where Strauss is like, you know, who who was the senator who who, who uh, you know stuck up for Oppenheimer and and then <laughs> freaking they got a Han Solo like uh it's uh Kennedy sir uh uh, John F. Kennedy, and it's like everyone in the theater was like, "Woo!" And I was like, "What the fuck? <laughs> That's so stupid!" Like, okay, whatever. Uh, now in hindsight, I find it kind of cute. Like, it's so stupid and so cheesy. I'm like, I'm like, I'm happy it's there just for the meme ability. Like, it's not as it doesn't it's not as offensive and stupid as as the you know I am, <laughs> I am the dick destroyer of ass. Like that 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 really annoyed me, but you know. That was stupid. As far as dialogue, that was excellent. Anything with Einstein was amazing. I mean, the, the tricky thing is that technically speaking, that's actually the most romanticized and dramatized part of the whole movie. Because the thing is, yes, they were friends and yes, they spent a lot of time together and, and, and had conversations throughout the years. None of it was really recorded from what I understand. So most of the dialogue between them, like I think him like sharing the plans and all that, I don't actually think that happened. I think it's more just illustrating, you know, here's a man who is truly one of the few people on earth who can actually understand the weight and significance of what he's going through. And he, he, since he's a famous figure that people know, it was easy to use him to illustrate a lot of the story's points. And that ending scene where they're at the pond, you know, the beginning of the movie, it starts with raindrops, little tiny droplets. And then at the end, it's this big pond and you see the ripples and it's representing all the explosions. And Oppenheimer drops that line where he's like, you know, when I said, 
the world might, you know, it might, the bombs might start a chain reaction, it'll destroy the world. And I said, like, yes, I remember it well. And he's like, I, you know, I think we have. It's like, oh, fuck. Like, that's so deep. It's like insane. It, I mean, my, my, my heart dropped down into my stomach. And it, it just, you see the montage of the missiles flying and the world setting on fire. I mean, what, what a, just, mm, that is a, 20 100 out of 10 like that was a perfect way to end the movie and it just i don't know it just i can't stop thinking about that scene and i can't stop listening to that score and i love that uh you know you have han solo <laughs> telling strauss like you know maybe einstein and oppenheimer weren't talking about you they're talking about some shit that's more important and it's like yeah dude the fact that we fucked the world basically um that was that was amazing and i i i was left fully satisfied the first and the second time I watched the movie. Even though Tom Conti didn't have an abundance of screen time, he brings such an inviting warmth and charisma that is very much like the real life Einstein. And he couldn't help but feel this like magical presence anytime he showed up on screen. It made me jealous. Like I wanna skip rocks on the pond with him and have like deep ass conversations. It'd be chill as fuck. We could even wear some matching girly ass sandals. I don't mind. So while the movie is not 100% perfect in my eyes, I still would consider it a masterpiece and a crowning achievement without a doubt from just a cinematography perspective, from the score, the acting. I mean, you could not ask for a better cast or a better director to tell the story. So, I mean, I just got to give all the credit in the world where it's due. But that sums up basically everything I wanted to say. So uh, I hope you enjoyed this stupidly long review and I hope you enjoyed the stupidly long movie. Now, if you'll excuse me, I've been sitting in this chair for a long time. I got my own bomb the drop if you know what I'm saying. <laughs>